Okay, so what is a PCI option ROM? Well, it's basically a blob of arbitrary machine code. So x86 code that the BIOS just reads in and runs. So yeah, you can see how that could be a security problem. So not every PCI device will necessarily have an option ROM. It typically has to do with whether or not the device needs to do something at boot time and whether or not the device follows some sort of standard. So you can imagine that things like graphic cards need to display graphics at boot time, network cards need to support network boot, and things like hardware RAID controllers need to be available so that you can actually boot off of the hard drives that they're managing. So if option ROMs are just some arbitrary machine code and if they're executed by the BIOS, you can see that they have a very high privilege level indeed. Now, returning to this picture from before, I didn't plan this, but if we actually zoom in on the particular NIC card that I was using as my diagram, we have to ask the question, what's that? That looks like a non-volatile storage chip, a spy flash chip, like this kind of thing that we've been seeing throughout. And we previously were using this spy flash chip to refer to the main board BIOS, but such a chip could exist on your PCI peripheral. And it's basically just hanging around saying, run me, you know, BIOS, run me, run me. And it just wants arbitrary code to be executed in the context of a BIOS. So yeah, arbitrary code in the context of the BIOS is a powerful and privileged thing. They who run first run best. On most systems, if it's allowed to run, it's going to be running with effectively ring zero privileges, full and arbitrary control over the system. And so it can do a lot of damage. There's no effective difference between PCI and PCIe in terms of how they behave with respect to option ROMs. And in both cases, they're managed by a separate bar, base address register, called the expansion ROM bar. Now, these are frequently called expansion ROMs or option ROMs, and the original notion was that it's optional, that a particular hardware piece didn't actually need one of these flash chips attached to them, but they could use it if they wanted. And the expansion portion refers to the fact that this is kind of like an expansion of functionality. So different chunks of the PCI documentation refer to it as either. I personally see the use of option ROM more frequently than expansion ROM, but I'm going to have to use both of them interchangeably throughout this class. So if we return to the PCI standardized header, we'll see that at offset hex 30, there is something called the expansion ROM base address. And this is a base address in the same form as the bars that we learned about before, and it's managed much the same way. But basically, the BIOS will set this up to allow for a memory mapped I.O., and then it will actually read the contents of that memory mapped I.O. and copy it to RAM and then execute it from RAM instead. So this is the format of the expansion ROM base address, and it's slightly different from the other normal base addresses that we saw before that the least significant bit is the enable bit, which is just saying if this is used. You can see here that it's actually reserving 11 bits rather than you know the four bits in the case of normal bars or two bits in the case of port IO bars. And so then the upper 21 bits are used to specify the actual memory mapped base. And so this is read and written just like normal bars. And also again, there's that command register in the PCI header. And it is only when this thing is set to memory spaces enabled and when the least significant bit is enabled that the option ROM will actually be enabled. So as with normal bars, the BIOS will write all ones into these 21 bits. And then if it reads back something other than all ones, that means the hardware is saying, yes, I support an option ROM, and yes, I'd like you to map it into memory for me. And here are the bits that are available for the address to specify the size. So you can think of those again as the don't care bits, or you can just run a two's complement on the return value. So in this case, it returned FFFE0000. So you flip the bits and add one, and it's basically saying it's this size worth of space. Now in terms of the actual base address where this can then be mapped, like when you put in a real base address here, it's of course gonna have to be 128 kilobyte aligned because these 11 bits are all expected to be zero. So, you know, it has to start with, you know, 000, 2000, 400, etc. So then the BIOS just puts some particular location into this address. Again, the BIOS is responsible for maintaining the memory map and it has to keep track of, you know, what's where all over the system. So it puts an address in there that it knows no one else is using the physical address space for, and then it enables it. So returning once again to this picture, and we expand out that memory mapped IO space, we have uh, the PCI NIC, but now we know that we can add the flash chip to it. 
And basically, if Miss Frizzle pokes some of these registers, specifically the expansion ROM base address register in the 256 bytes of memory mapped I.O., or port I.O., I suppose, then the OROM base address register can be filled in with a particular physical address that will be used for the memory mapped I.O. of this bar. Only memory mapped I.O., no port I.O. access to option ROMs. And so what that does is that if, you know, there was some sort of read or write from this memory mapped I.O. region, it's actually reading and writing from the flash chip on the peripheral device. So what's typically going to happen is then the BIOS is going to copy that information down into RAM using a mem copy effectively. And then once there's a copy in RAM, basically... <laughs> and it's going to call into that particular RAM copy of the option ROM. In order to execute the arbitrary code that potentially an attacker has installed into this external peripheral device in the context of the BIOS, allowing it to infect anything else later on in the system. So that's not a good time. All right, once there is a memory map copy, the BIOS is not actually supposed to jump into it unless it does a little bit of sanity checking of data structures that are expected to be at the beginning. Specifically, the 0th byte is expected to be 5.5, the 1th byte is expected to be AA. And so if that's not the case, then this means it's not treated like a normal, proper, valid option ROM, and they shouldn't be jumping into the code anywhere. But if it is the case, then at offset 3, there is an entry point that says where specifically in this memory mapped region it should jump in order to execute the code. So overall, you should think of option ROMs like they're effectively a device driver for a particular device that needs to execute in the context of a BIOS. It contains arbitrary code because any given BIOS, when confronted with the myriad of possible PCI peripherals, may not have a driver built into it. And therefore, it's expected to basically grab a driver off of the device and execute that driver, which will subsequently, you know, initialize all of the rest of the registers on that particular piece of hardware and make it available for running and being a useful device. So that's it for option ROM attacks. And now you can see a whole bunch of other research that you can dig into and understand what exactly people did with option ROMs. But it really comes down to, you know, how did you actually infect it in the first place? And what mechanisms, if any, does the operating system have to sort of constrain or restrict the introduction of malicious code via option ROMs? There's multiple different approaches to that, and things like UEFI secure boot systems are supposed to use things like digital signatures over the option ROMs so that an attacker can't just arbitrarily update that code unless they can also forge a digital signature. But unfortunately, a lot of systems don't actually have signed option ROMs and BIOSes because the customers expect their devices to work typically will either, you know, allow for disabling of those checks or not do the check at all in the first place. Other systems, like Mac systems, after Corey Kallenberg made his changes, do things like jailing the option ROMs so that they're not effectively ring zero, so they're significantly deprivileged. Or you can have user opt-in mechanisms like firmware password that basically say, if this is set, just don't run any option ROMs. I know that those could be used to attack me.